the word of the Lord. James writes, Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might, uh, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, as we pause this first day of the week and draw our attention to your inerrant, infallible, trustworthy, and sufficient word, we pray that you would oversee and supersede this service today, that you would hide me behind your cross and work in the hearts and lives of your people despite my human weakness and frailty, that my stuttering and unclarity of thought would not get in the way of your message going forth to your people today. And so, Lord, I pray that you would do your work in our hearts, that you would use your word as a tool, as a scalpel to do surgery on our hearts, that the close of the service today, that we would be more fit to give you honor and glory and praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, I, I assume that everyone here knows that this Tuesday, there is a major election uh, here in the United States, a presidential election. And uh, I want to just say a couple of words about that uh, this morning. Uh, not too much. You know, I don't focus on politics much, but this many have said that this very likely is the most important presidential uh, election of our lifetime so far. And I think that's true, even though uh, we said the same thing four years ago uh, and eight years ago. Uh, and probably it, 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 in all truth, it was true every time. Because the stakes just seem to be increasing exponentially. And I do know that this election, I'm pretty sure I'm safe to say that there's never been a presidential election where the two parties are so drastically and obviously in two polar extremes. So it's a very important election for those of us here that live in the United States of America. Now I understand that here in the state of Mississippi, uh, we are not in one of the battleground states. We are not in one of the swing states. But nonetheless, I would encourage you as a Christian, we have uh, been blessed by God to live in a nation where we can go to the polls and make our uh, requests known, our voice known, our voice heard. We should not take that for granted. And the more Christians in the state of Mississippi that get out to the polls, the better. So let me encourage you to do that. Now you might be asking yourself the question, what does the presidential election have to do with James chapter 1, verse 18? Right, Brian? Well, hear me out. I ho hope this doesn't come across as, a, as an awkward pun. Uh, I'm not really trying to be. Uh, but there is a, a connection here, a very loose tangential uh, connection, but one nonetheless because as we think of the presidential election, this passage of Scripture does deal with the biblical doctrine of election, uh, as well as the biblical doctrine of regeneration, uh, the authority of Scripture, and a few other things. Now, as we talk about the doctrine of election, of course, the Bible is not talking about, with the doctrine, when we speak of the doctrine of election, we're not talking about a people electing a ruler. Instead, it's actually, if you think about it, it's a ruler electing a people, you see. And so when here in this passage, it is not talking about us choosing a leader over us. It's about a leader over us, namely the supreme leader of all, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, God, the sovereign God of the universe himself, choosing you if you're a believer, if you're a Christian we're in that number. And so let me kind of unpack this a bit as we look at this. Just one verse of Scripture. I just wanted to look at one verse today because it's so packed 
uh, with theology that uh, James just assumes that we're understanding as he is making his point. But I don't want to make that same assumption here this morning. And so let, let's see if we can make some sense of it all. And so at first, the first point that he makes, and as we kind of divide this verse into three three constituent parts and kind of put them together. The first thing that he mentions is the doctrine of election, as I said, and the doctrine of regeneration. Now I'm using big words intentionally here because they give some specificity to the theology that James is addressing. And I'm going to go ahead and just uh, stick my neck out and maybe even kind of go on a little bit of a rant this morning, uh, Andrew, about uh, some theology and being specific with our theology, because I think that one of the major problems in American Christianity in our generation is the fact that the last couple of generations have sort of watered down our theology. They're trying to, and it was good intention sometimes. I should say sometimes. There are have been some very bad actors in this whole uh, thing of Christianity in America today. I'm not talking about the bad actors uh, that are intentionally doing all of those things. Uh, we've talked about those before. We'll talk about them again. But I'm talking about well-intentioned people being slo what I call sloppy theology. Sloppy theology. Uh, their intention was that uh, some people just have short attention spans and, and, and they don't want to uh, get tangled up with big words. And so uh, let's just water this down to, to make it simple. And would, do we really need to talk about regeneration or justification or the imputed righteousness of Christ and all these big technical words? Can't we just talk about getting saved? That's that's their their mentality, you know. And so and and and, and there's there's some advantage to that. However, it has some disastrous consequences. And I think the state of the modern church in America today is by and large affected by this good intentions of watering things down. Because, I, well, I said I was going to go on a rant, so I'll go ahead and step up on a soapbox for a second. I'll, I'll tell you, I have very little patience with people who call themselves Christians, who come to the Scriptures with the mentality, let me learn as little as possible. I kind of like my ignorance. I really don't want to know about Jesus too, too much. I really don't want to understand how my salvation works too, too much. Can't we just have some pictures of ponies and rainbows and, and butterflies and tell everybody that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life and go eat lunch? Uh, wouldn't that be much better? And I am here to say, no, that would not be much better. That is why hell has as many people as it has today. Because we live in a generation where the Word of God doesn't go forth from the pulpits like they used to, like it used to, in years gone by. I, I'll give you. Let's, let's get to the doctrine of regeneration. Well, I'll go ahead and back into it a little bit here, uh, and, and and tell you a couple of stories. Let, let, let me. I, I Charlie. I um. We, we've talked about this before that I have in my past. I have uh, sat at the feet of a very well-known, or at least in their circles, an independent fundamental Baptist preacher named Jack Hiles. He's dead now, but and so this was back in the 80s. I spent a couple of years at his college up in Indiana. A uh, large church, a lot of people. Uh, and it seemed as a 18, 19, 20-year-old kid that there was some things happening. And I got excited about that. Uh, people were getting baptized and and going to church and carrying their Bibles and I uh, had some some grit in their craw done and, and so I said you know there's something about that that I that I like there's somebody standing up for truth and I got there and saw some the underside of things and how it was really working out and I said something's wrong here something just isn't right I couldn't really put my finger on it Brian but something wasn't right I remember I never forget sitting in a in a in a, a what they called the preacher boy class and Jack Isles was training us young preacher boys, uh, that's what he called, they called us, uh, how to give an invitation at the end of a service, an altar call, Charlie, uh, that, is, that was very popular, still is in many circles, uh, an altar call. And at the end of a service, you would call people to the front of the room to make a decision for Christ. Well, Jack Hiles was telling us young preacher boys how to do that the right way. And one of the, a couple of the things that he said 
was, he says, when you go, when you're preaching and you get in your sermon, he said, never say, this is my last point. Never say in conclusion. Uh, never give them a, a, a hint that you're about to land the plane. Never let them know that the sermon is almost over. And here was his logic. He said, because if you do that, sinners will be out there in the pews and they know the invitation is coming and they're going to dig in their heels and sort of fight against it. And so what you need to do is sort of sneak up on them. <laughs> you know, you sneak up on them and they'll never know what hit them. Uh, and, so, and he literally said that. And so that, that he reduced salvation to an emotional, manipulative plea at the end of the service in an unguarded moment and admitted it in an unguarded moment that he could coax people to the front of the room. Not only that, he said to, to go even further, he said that when you do get to the end and you're getting people to stand up and walk down to the front of the room, don't tell them what you're about to sing. Tell them the hymn number and then get them to stand and then start to sing and then invite them to the front of the room. He said, no, 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 no. You've lost the mood if you do that. Uh, you've lost the, the impulse. He says what you need to do is set it up so that when they stand up, they immediately are asked to come to the to the room. So it's all one motion, not two motions. If you get them to do two things, that might be too confusing, emotionally confusing. And so you get them to stand up and start walking to the front. And he said that you'll get more people down the front that way. Uh, and then even on top of that, he would plant people in the set service that they were going to come forward no matter what. They weren't coming forward to get saved, uh, but they would just come forward every every week so that if there's somebody else there, they wouldn't feel uncomfortable thinking they're the only one walking forward. And so we'll plant people there and they'll come forward and as you stand up and the music starts to play, it'll be easier for them to walk forward. Now, I don't know if anybody here this morning is saying, what's wrong with that? But I'll tell you, that's not how it works. I wish we could go to hell and talk to people and ask them how that's working out for them. Salvation is not something that some decision that someone makes in an unguarded moment where their emotions are manipulated and they're tricked to walk down the front of the room and not really understanding what's going on. No, that is not how it works. I can tell you a story after story after story. I wasn't going to tell this one. Well, I won't tell, I won't tell their name. Years, and I won't even give the specifics, but I wasn't even planning on it, but I just, it just popped in my memory. And one, one time, there was a large evangelistic, put that in scare quotes, meeting here in a county, and other church was doing it, and they had some a big people came to do this thing, and they sent me a list of people who made decisions for Christ that week uh, at this big event. And I was, and that they lived, that who lived in Lakeshore. That's what they were saying. These people lived in Lakeshore. And as I'm going through the list, one of those was an extremely familiar name. I won't say who it was. It was someone. And when I talked to that person, they said, Brother Don, I didn't even know what I was doing. Uh, they, we were in there. They were selling stuff. And they, before you knew it, we was up in the front and signing a card. And I thought we were just saying who, that we love Jesus. I didn't know what was. They, and they were tricking this person to walk down the aisle. I call. I made tried to get contact with all the other names in that folder. I think it was like ten or twelve. None of them had genuinely repented their sins and trusted in Christ. Now I say all that to get to the underside of that. How does that happen? How do things like that happen? I'll tell you why. Because there are people behind that who are saying we don't really need to care about how theology works. We just know that somebody needs to pray a prayer and ask Jesus into their heart. And so if we could talk them into that and get them to make a decision, then they'll be saved. The problem is with, with that is not just the practice. The, the, pra the problem is the theology underneath it. And so let me, let, me, uh, let me be blunt and say, a person is not saved by a decision they make. Did you hear me? A person is not saved by a decision they make. It's a false doctrine called decisional regeneration. 
It's very similar to a false doctrine that we see in some denominations that we as Baptists will very, be very quick to point out called baptismal regeneration. Uh, there are some denominations that teach in order to be saved, you have to be baptized. Now, we believe in baptism. We believe that once you are saved, you ought to get baptized. But that baptism does not save you. But there are those who twist the Scriptures and fan them on their head and turn them inside out and say that when you're dunked underneath the water, somehow that water has some sort of magic uh, uh, effect on you spiritually and that you're saved by getting dunked in the water or sprinkled as a baby. And the Bible is very clear on that. And we as Baptists are very clear on that. That baptismal regeneration is a damnable heresy. That is not how you get saved. That is turning people away from God, giving them a false hope. I would say the same thing about decisional regeneration. Decisional regeneration that tells someone that you are regenerated, that you are born again. We have reference to John 3 when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about being born again, that it is something that you do. You make a decision and your decision triggers your new birth. The Bible is very plain that that is not how it works. Here we see in James chapter 1, verse 18, we see whose initiative is behind your new birth. Notice what he says in verse 18. Of His own will. Who is he speaking of? God, the Father of lights. There in verse 17. Of His will you, are, you have brought us forth by the word of truth. You have brought us forth. You have regenerated us. We don't regenerate ourselves. Or to use Jesus' language, we don't birth ourselves. Uh, there's an old joke. It's a horrible joke, especially with my, my dad here. Uh, uh, dad, uh, I, I heard these, these this father and son who didn't get along. I praise God that I have a godly father and we get along very well. This father and son didn't get along. And, and the, dad, dad, the son told his dad, I sure... I, no, he, no he, said, he said, I never asked to get... To, to get born. He was telling his dad, I didn't ask to get born. Uh, and his dad uh, report, retorted back. He said, good thing you didn't ask to be born. I'd have said no. <laughs> you know? And so, and so but it, underneath that joke, we see no one asks to be born. This is something that is done outside of yourself. It's not your initiative. You weren't floating around in limbo one day and said, you know what? I think I would like to be born. Uh, no, it's something totally outside of yourself. And so that is why it's the fitting analogy that Jesus makes with our regeneration and says, you must be born again. This is why in John chapter 1, he says that we're born not of the flesh, not of blood, not of the will of man, but of God. Here in James chapter 1, verse 18, he says, this, Jesus has the initiative of our salvation. Now here's where I want to explain why, we, why I said a moment ago, why we use these technical terminologies of regeneration, justification, imputed righteousness of Christ, forgiveness, the adoption. All of these things are aspects of our salvation. When I was growing up, I, and I, I'm not trying to belittle uh, the church that I was raised in, but somehow along the way that I, I thought that regeneration and justification and some of these other words were just big words that all meant the same thing, salvation. But in fact, salvation is sort of the big umbrella. And in that, there's aspects of our salvation that all can happen, sim that all do happen simultaneously. It all happens at the same time. We're regenerated. And then we have faith. And then we, that, that, well, I'll, I'll walk through, through it like this. As we are born again, not by baptism, not by a decision we make, but by the Spirit of God. And we'll talk about how the instrumentality of that in a second through the Word of Truth. And so He regenerates us. Then when we are regenerated, we have new eyes. We have a new heart. The Apostle Paul talks about how you were once dead in your trespasses and sin, and now you have been made alive. And so that's the regeneration, the new birth. Now you are going from death into life. That new life that you have, that new heart that you have. See, the dead heart did not believe in God. The dead heart did not repent of its sin. The dead heart didn't trust Christ. But the new heart does. 
That new heart that God gives us immediately, that new heart beats with faith in Jesus Christ. And so that regeneration precedes faith. Then as we repent of our sins and we trust in Christ, and so those are, that's two sides of the same coin. We're turning away from our sin and turning toward Christ. And so you might, you might, if you listen to me closely, you might be thinking that I'm talking out both sides of my mouth because I will say, hey, Andrew, sometimes a cage stage Calvinist uh, will talk, will really emphasize what I was just saying, that we are not saved by our choice. We are not regenerated by our choice. But I need to be careful as we beat that drum very loudly that we don't then separate it from us actually do choosing, we do choose Christ. I mean, you're not saved if you don't choose Christ, right? But does the choosing of Christ trigger your regeneration? Or does your regeneration trigger your trusting in Christ? I would say it's the latter. So, so Christ, uh, so God regenerates us. He gives us new birth. We have a new heart. And that new heart chooses Christ. That new heart trusts in Christ. And so, what, what, and so what, what James is saying here is extremely important. And so that's why I spelled out, uh, I started with the application and then backed into the theology there. That you might, because, uh, because oftentimes when I explain this, people say, so what? So what if you misunderstand how salvation works? So what if you do? The difference is between heaven and hell. The difference is whether you're trusting Christ or trusting yourself. You see, trusting yourself is a dead end road. Trusting Christ is the way of salvation. And so it is God and God alone that pulls the trigger on your election, uh, pulls the lever on your election. And so here he is very specific here. Another quick thing before we look at the instrumentality of it, though, because it, I, I thought it was interesting because it almost seems as if two, two things that in verse 18, if you've been here with us on in, in, the, in the book of James, uh, it seems like he's shifting gears and changing topics and talking about something totally different. But there's two connections to what he's going on before. I say the first one, the most, most obvious one first. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about where temptation comes from. That's what, what James is talking about. He's saying, look, while God is sovereign and in control of all things, if you are tempted to sin, don't blame God. How, where does temptation come from? He says, it's your own fault. Uh, it comes from you. It comes from those desires that are then uh, coupled with deception and it results in death. He says, only good things come from God. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. He says, and so last week we looked at some of those good gifts. The good gifts that He gives us in common grace of just the beauty of the world and good food and, 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 and pleasant things and all of those things. But more importantly than that, salvation itself. And that's where He goes with this. That the good thing of your salvation, your regeneration, your new birth, that is a gift from God. You hear the same thing from the Apostle Paul that says that much uh, just as clear when he sa says that we are saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so here, James is talking about the gift that God gives us of the new birth. Another interesting connection there, what he was saying with the temptation. Remember, he says, where does sin come from? Where does, where does it come from? It doesn't come from God. It comes when your desires, and sometimes those desires may even be good desires. A desire for food, the desire for shelter, the desire for intimacy, uh, and all of those things. Those are some good desires that God gets, uh, gives us if we keep it on the tracks and not jump the jump the tracks is where it gets problem. And so James spells out where the problem comes in. It's when our desires connect with, or uh, he actually uses what might be some sort of risque language if you think about it. He says when your desires uh, get together with uh, with uh, deception, with deception. And so your desires that might be good in and of themselves are then coupled in, in, in the backseat with a, with deception, the offspring that comes is disobedience to God. And then he says, and when disobedience is full grown, it get, brings forth death. That brings forth death or gives birth to death is the same word that he uses here. 
that God gives birth to life. You say our sin gives birth to death. God gives birth to life. And so it is God who is behind it all. So God gets the glory. Not us, not our deception, not our um, our uh, deceiving people into doing twisting them to say something, but instead that we're clear with the message of the Gospel. And that's where the next point comes in when he says through the Word of Truth. Through the Word of Truth. Notice what he says. He says, of His own will, God's will, of His own will, brought us forth by, here's the instrumentality, the Word of Truth. Through the Word of Truth. And so God doesn't just save you out of you just like walking down the street and just zap you out of nowhere. No. How does God save a person? By first giving them the Word of Truth. And He does that through means. He does that through our uh, giving them the Gospel. of, and, and I'll talk more about evangelism and missions for those of you that will join us for our Bible study at Bayside uh, this afternoon, evangelism and missions and all the various ways that we can give the gospel to people through preaching, through discussions, through gospel tracts, through YouTube videos, uh, through social media, through discussions over the dinner table, over the back fence, in the back of a pick, uh, leaning over the back of a pickup truck. However, those conversations come. It's the word of truth that God uses to bring life. And so he says the word of truth. It's an interesting phrase, phraseology here that he uses. The word of truth. The New Testament, I won't take the time to, to look at all of the passages that deal with, that use this phrase, the word of truth. It kind of is used at, at two different levels. Both the same thing, but one more general than the other. One, for example, when Paul uh, talk, is talking to Timothy, and he says, study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And so he's telling uh, a young preacher boy, uh, here he says, this is what you need to learn how to do. You need to rightly divide the word of truth or rightly handle the word of truth. Figure out how this passage uh, interacts with this passage. It's basically, to use the academic term, the, doc, the discipline of hermeneutics, which is just a fancy word of saying the methodology that we use to study the Bible correctly. Uh, and, and oh, for the sake of time, I was going to spend a whole time uh, sort of blowing the trumpet for, Herman, for right hermeneutics. We'll save that for another day. But it's very important to understand how the Bible works and to rightly interpret it and apply it to our lives. But, and so, the, so sometimes the word of truth, this phraseology, the word of truth, is used in a big way to speak of all of the Scriptures. But then sometimes it's more specific, the one particular aspect of the Scriptures, and that is the Gospel itself. The good news of the Gospel itself. Paul uses this terminology, the word of truth, comma, the Gospel, in Corinthians and other places, to speak specifically of the Gospel going forth. That good news that God saves sinners. The good news starts with bad news, of course. We can't understand the good news unless you understand the bad news. You can't understand the good news that there's a medicine uh, unless you know the bad news that you're sick, right? And so you have to understand the bad news first. And the bad news is that we are not only sick, we are spiritually dead apart from Christ. We have broken God's laws. We have turned away from His commandments. He has created us in His image and we have marred that image. That's the bad news. The good news is that God Himself came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. He came to earth and lived a sinless life. And He died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin. Not of His sin, because He had no sin. But of the sins of all who would repent and believe. That is the good news of the Gospel. He was buried and on the third day rose victorious. Proving that He is victorious over sin, hell, death, and the grave proving that His sacrifice was accepted by a holy God. And that good news message is what the Holy Spirit uses for spiritual regeneration. You see, uh, that, that ought to free us up. I know for a, a personal testimony of, of mine as a, as a Christian and as especially as a, as a preacher, but just as a Christian to understand it is not my responsibility to manipulate someone's emotions. 
It is not my responsibility to trick somebody into coming to church or trick somebody into praying a prayer or to trick somebody into trust, to, to giving lip service of trusting Christ. You know what my job is? To explain the gospel well so that the Holy Spirit then uses it to regenerate a lost soul and turn their heart to Christ. You, you, you see the difference there. And that's why the difference between sloppy theology and biblical theology is the difference between heaven and hell. But lastly, for the sake of time, I need to, to move forward to this last little phrase that he uses here because I think it's, it's so beautiful where he says, he says the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's the goal. So first we looked at who initiates this whole thing. It's God, not us. We don't initiate our salvation. God initiates our salvation. And so it's by His will. Secondly, we saw that the instrumentality of it, it is the Word of, of truth. It is the Gospel that causes the effect. It is the, the outward call that then triggers that inward effectual call that the Holy Spirit does His work. But then finally we look at the purpose it is so that God could have for Himself what James uses here is first fruits. Have you ever come across that phrase uh, before first fruits? Uh, if you click on it, you can click on it and go back to the Old Testament. Uh, it's an interesting background here. I'll try to be brief. In the Old Testament laws, they were required, and remember this is an agricultural, agrarian society, and they were required to take their first fruits of their harvest, uh, of their livestock, and give them as an offering to the Lord. And so their first fruits it meant <coughs> not only the earliest crops, it was that, it, it was not only your earliest crops. It wasn't as if God says, okay, what you need to do is you plant your garden, you plant your fields, you harvest them all, and, and once your family is taken care of, and once you have enough food on the table, and once you share it with your neighbors and friends, if there happens to be any left over, you can bring it down to the church. That, that's not what he, that's what he said. No, that's not how it works. God deserves your first fruits right off the top, from the very beginning, before everything else. You know why? Because what that's doing is admitting that all of these things comes from God anyway. You know, we can till, the, the Bible actually says this specifically, you can till the ground and, and you can plant the seed, but it's God who gives the increase. And so in the Old Testament, under the Mosaic uh, laws, they said to symbolize that, to reinforce that, to, uh, to, to lend our agreement to that as a, a great object lesson is right on the top, that is what we give to the Lord, because He is the one who gave it all to us first. And so the first fruits. But also in that first fruits, it's not just the earliest, first also can denote the best. And so first in priority. And so it's not, hey, here's my crop. Let me, I got a, the first stuff that I need. So, hey, look, here's, here's some stuff that's kind of uh, has some bruises on it, and here's some diseased animal here, and maybe that's what I'll give to God. He says, no, God deserves your very best. Now that might seem on the surface that God's being greedy. But no, what He's doing is reminding you that everything you have comes from God to begin with. You see? And so when He, when he does that, that's, that's the Old Testament picture. And we, I, I could spend a little bit more time with that. I think, I think you understand that. And so now James, what James is doing is he's taking that out of the Old Testament understanding, this metaphor of the first fruits, and he says, you know who God's first fruits really are? Is you. Is you. Because God is the one that watered you. God's the one that planted you. God's the one that tilled the soil. God's the one from the, that initiated it all. And He is having a first fruits to give to God, which is Himself. I know, I know he's kind of, that kind of mixes the metaphor there, uh, but you see what He's saying is that there is a purpose in, the, the, in your salvation so that God can have for Himself you. It reminds me of the old uh, missionary story that I heard uh, years and years ago about a missionary having a, it was like in Africa or, or something like that, and, and he's giving an, taking up an offering with this guy that had been to the service 
uh, the week before that had gotten saved. And when they gave the offering, everybody kind of walked up to give the offering, similar the way we do it. We don't have it part of the service now, but we do have offering plates up here so you can, after the service or before the service or whatever, come and, and, and give uh, what you can. Uh, at this particular uh, service, The guy, a guy that had gotten saved the week before walked down the aisle and he picked up the offering plate and since he didn't have anything to put put in the offering plate, he put the offering plate and they had like his big basket, put it on the ground, and he climbed in it himself. <laughs> and the preacher's like, what are you doing? He says, I don't have any money, but I'm giving myself to God. And that's, how, that's what James is talking about here, that God saved us so that He could have us for Himself. And so God pulls the lever and elects you to salvation. For your new birth, to give you new eyes, to give you a new heart, and that new heart beats with faith in Jesus Christ so that we can be His first fruits. Another aspect of these first fruits is that it is a reminder of what is to come. What is to come is a forward looking, a hopeful looking. And so here, embedded in this one little short verse, is looking back at our salvation, looking today at our sanctification, and looking forward to what God will continue to do in our life, in the life of our families, in the life of our church, in the life of our community, because we are His first fruits. And the best is yet to come. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I do thank You for the finished work of Christ on the cross. I thank You for in my deadness of sin, that You reached out and gave me new life. A new heart. Eyes that can see and savor the supremacy of Christ over all things. Ears that listen for Your Word of truth to come forth. A heart that beats with faith and repentance toward Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we may be faithful proclaiming that word as we rejoice in your first fruits that you deserve. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.